What makes a better brisket, an offset smoker or a reverse flow smoker? The Oklahoma Joe's Longhorn reverse flow can be set up either way, so I'm testing two briskets on it, one with the direct flow setup and one with the reverse flow setup, and I'm going to compare them to see which one is better, so let's get smoking. Welcome to the Smoke Lab, guys, the show where I do crazy barbecue experiments you would never do at home so you can learn from my trial and error. As always, if you have any requests for experiments you'd like to see on the Smoke Lab, then drop them in the comment section below. And also all of the show notes and recipes and techniques are in the description section below in this video. Now. Direct flow offset smokers. These are the type of smokers you see really famous barbecue pit masters use in Texas to cook brisket, and there's a good reason for that. The fire starts in the offset smoker firebox. That's why they call it an offset smoker because the firebox is offset from the cooking chamber. The heat and smoke then goes up over top of the brisket, cooking it from the top down, and then it exits through the stack on the opposite side. Pros of a direct flow offset are one, you get a lot of really nice smoky convective heat cooking the brisket from the top down, which renders the fat cap of a brisket really well and provides a nice extremely dark bark, which is why top barbecue restaurants use them in Texas. And two, it has an open chamber concept, which means that the meat is suspended on a cooking grate away from any radiant heat sources like the fire or or a hot piece of metal so that you just get nice, gentle, convective heat cooking the brisket from the top down. Now, the cons are that one, there is a huge hot spot right next to the firebox. So if you don't want to burn your meat, you won't want to put your brisket very close to the firebox, which means you lose out on a lot of cooking area. And second, you're cooking primarily from the top down. So you can get a lot of uneven cooking unless you use certain techniques like rotating your brisket or foiling dry edges or spritzing or using wood blockers. Now, moving on to reverse flow smokers. They're set up pretty much the same way as a direct flow offset, but as the heat comes out of the firebox, it's forced under a large baffle plate, and then it has to make almost a 90 degree turn up over top of the brisket and then out the stack on the opposite side of the smoker. Now, the pros of a reverse flow are that it has much more even temperature control because you're getting nice gentle convective heat being forced under the baffle plate and up and over the brisket on the left-hand side of the smoker, and you're also getting some radiant heat from underneath the brisket as as that convective heat heats up the baffle plate, you're getting heat from below as well as from above. So it's much more consistent in terms of temperatures. Second, it's also useful because you have a lot more cooking area because you don't have a hot spot right near the firebox. Well, much of a hot spot. It still gets hot there, but if you're cooking a lot of meat, you can utilize a lot more cooking surface than you could with a direct flow offset where you're losing out on that third of the smoker that is right next to the firebox. Now, the cons of a reverse flow are that one, you're restricting the airflow quite a bit with that baffle plate and that 90 degree turn, and the smoke has a longer distance to travel. So you're not getting as much top down convective heat on top of the brisket that can really darken it up and help you render the bark. And second, because you're forcing convective air under that baffle plate, plate, the baffle plate can get really hot and it can shed radiant heat directly below the brisket into the bottom of the brisket, potentially overcooking some areas of your brisket. But the big question in my mind is which one makes a better brisket? Luckily, the Oklahoma Joe's Longhorn Reverse Flow can be set up in either way. So I'm going to test one brisket with the direct flow setup. I'm going to test one with the reverse flow setup and I'm going to compare them to see which one is better. Starting with the direct flow brisket, I'm preparing a rub with a quarter cup kosher salt, a quarter cup coarse ground black pepper, and a tablespoon of Lowry's seasoned salt, using a bit of vegetable oil to bind the rub together. And while the briskets soak up that rub, I'm chopping up some wood splits with my alligator chainsaw loppers, so I have a stack of nicely sized splits for the cook. Starting with a bed of charcoal, I'm adding a split of wood, and every 20 or 30 minutes or so, I'll add another split to keep the temperatures at a steady 250, give or take 25 degrees either way. Now the brisket is going on the smoker with a large water pan right next to it. I like to leave a couple inches of gap between the water pan and the firebox because I want that air to be forced up and over the water pan and the brisket. I don't want it to be forced under the water pan so it cooks the brisket from the bottom up. Again, we want that convective heat going from the top down so we can nicely render the brisket fat cap and add some dark color. And then after five hours at 250, I'm adding more water to the water pan and rotating the brisket to help it cook a little more evenly. I'm then going to ramp temps up to 275 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit for the remainder of the cook. Seven hours later at the 12 hour mark, the brisket is probing at least 190 everywhere I 
probe and the bark is really looking good. So I'm taking it off the smoker, wrapping it in butcher paper with tallow and clarified butter. And then I'm wrapping it in foil and that's going to hold at 150 degrees for the next 15 to 20 hours. For instructions on how to do that, look at the description section below. Now moving on to the reverse flow brisket. I'm removing the grates and setting up the baffle plate so they cover the entire bottom of the cooking chamber, except for the opening on the left hand side, of course. Now I'm removing the stack from the left side of the smoker. It's just one bolt holding it in and I'm capping it off and moving the stack to the right hand side of the smoker in reverse flow format. Now I'm placing a water pan on the right hand side of the smoker next to the firebox and this is a little bit counterintuitive but the reason I do this is one there's no room below the baffle plates to put a water pan without severely restricting airflow and two having that big water pan right next to the firebox even if it's above the baffle plate ideally it's right on top of the baffle plate in contact with it but it absorbs the heat from the firebox all that radiant heat coming into the baffle plate it's going to absorb some of that so that baffle plate doesn't get so hot and overcook the bottom of your brisket with radiant heat. So it's a really effective way to help your brisket cook a little bit more evenly and remove some of the risk of overcooking the bottom of your brisket. Now, moving over to the firebox, I'm lighting a bed of charcoal with the Oklahoma Joe's charcoal lighter, link in the description below if you wanna pick one up. I find it's much more convenient than a chimney starter and a lot faster personally. And now the brisket goes on the longhorn with the exact same rub as the direct flow brisket. The difference here is that the brisket point is going to face left towards the direction the smoke is coming from instead of to the right where all of the convective heat would normally come from in the direct flow setup. We always want to put the fattier and thicker point towards the heat source, at least initially. Now I'm running the smoker at 250 degrees, give or take 25 degrees at any given time, and I'm adding splits every 20 or 30 minutes or so. Quick pro tip for the Longhorn, I like to preheat my splits on the firebox lid, and what I found is that it's colder on the flat area of the lid where it's raised up a little bit, and it's hotter on the round side of the lid. So if you want to heat up your splits a lot faster, just put them directly directly on the round area of the lid and they'll heat up super fast. So when you put them on the fire, they'll light almost immediately. Now at the five hour mark, I'm adding some water to the water pan and taking a look at the brisket. Now, normally I don't spritz my briskets at all, but if you look at the brisket, it looks kind of like there's some dried salt. There's some splotchy areas where the rub didn't get absorbed. So I'm giving it a quick spritz just to help dissolve that salt and help the bark along. You won't need to do this if you let your brisket sit on the counter for at least an hour before it goes on the smoker. Now, after five hours, Hours, I'm ramping temps up to 275 to 300 for the remainder of the cook checking on my fire it's going pretty strong I might add a few handfuls of charcoal when the charcoal bed looks a bit weak but otherwise I'm just adding a split or two every 20 or 30 minutes now at the 12 hour mark the brisket is probing at least 190 internal everywhere I probe so it's time to get wrapped but first I'm temping the baffle plate below the brisket just out of curiosity and you can see how it's around 275 to 300 degrees that means there's quite a bit of radiant heat going to the bottom of the brisket as opposed to the direct flow setup where we're only getting top down convective heat. Not to get too much into the science here, but if you want to cook your brisket more evenly and have better barbecue in general, then always look for areas that might emit radiant heat, such as a fire or a hot piece of metal. It could even be the side walls of your smoker. If you put your brisket too close to one side of the walls of your smoker, that edge could get burnt out because that metal is absorbing heat and shedding radiant heat back into the brisket. So look for opportunities to block radiant heat using water pans. You can use tin foil to foil off areas of the brisket. You can use wood as blockers. There's all sorts of different techniques, but if you're looking at becoming a better barbecue cook, just look at where that radiant heat is coming from. See how you can defeat it so you can just get nice, gentle, convective heat cooking your brisket. Now, the brisket is coming off the smoker. It's getting wrapped in clarified butter and tallow and butcher paper and foil, just like the other brisket, and it's getting held at 150 for 15 to 20 hours until we do the taste test comparison. All right, guys, this is the direct flow offset brisket that has been holding in my heating chest for the past 18 hours. It's time to unwrap this baby and see what it looks like. Okay, I've got my pitmaster gloves on, so now I can do some slicing. See, look at this, it's magical. Not a pitmaster, pitmaster. Not a pitmaster, pitmaster. Okay, let's analyze this brisket a little bit. I'm going to press down on the fat cap and see how squishy it is. So you can see if I press down on it, it takes a little while for it to raise up again. That's a good sign. It looks like there's not a lot of dark bark here. So I'll just mess with this area. And oh, you can see that there's some nice yellowing here, which is a good thing. That tells us that we've got a lot of convective hot air over the top of the brisket on this fat cap and it has properly rendered the fat cap. If you don't get that hot air over top of the brisket at a certain temperature, then often you'll just get that kind of milky white fat cap, which is still good, 
but it doesn't have the next level of flavor that the caramelly yellow type rendered fat has that comes from rendering it at a higher temperature in the offset. Now I'm gonna check out the tenderness of this brisket and I'm just going to use my thermometer, which I don't know where that is, but luckily I always carry an extra <clears throat> boot thermometer just in case I get into trouble. So I got an extra one here and I'm going to probe into the flat, probing it around 145, which is perfect. I usually like to slice into my briskets around 140. That is the perfect slicing temperature. The flat is probing really nice. Probe it over here. It's probing pretty nice. It's a little bit tough, but I can tell you that it's probably going to be tender. It's just a lot tougher than the point. The point is like butter, it's really nice. And the flat underneath the point is really tender as well. So all signs are good on this brisket so far. It's been cooked pretty well. It did get some crispy bits on the point here, but uh, it's actually pretty nice. The long hold in the holding chest in this moisture rich environment actually backed off the bark a little bit. So it started pretty crispy, maybe overly crispy, and then the bark rehydrated a little bit. So now it's perfect. So what I would say is with the direct flow setup on the Oklahoma Joe's Longhorn, what that has allowed us to do is to get nice hot air over the top of the brisket that has allowed the fat cap to properly render to that caramelly yellow type consistency that has a lot of flavor. It's properly rendered the point area with uh, a lot of fat on it that's usually quite thick. And because we rotated it a couple times during the cook every two hours, the point and the flat got cooked pretty evenly. But don't take my word for it. Let's cut into this thing and you can see for yourself. I'm gonna slice it right down the middle Slicing really nicely. I can tell it's really tender. Whew. I have a feeling it's gonna be a good one. So I'll move that out there and look at that. That is looking crazy good. Oh my God, look at that. I'm just gonna give it a little squeeze for you guys. Now I'm gonna cover this with a little bit of tallow that I've melted and that's just going to prevent the meat from oxidizing. It's gonna keep everything looking fresh. And now I'm going to take a slice of the flat. It's usually the leaner part of the brisket. So I like to start with it. Slicing really nicely. That is looking really nice. Looks like a little mouth. Hey guys, how's it going? It looks super delicious. It bends over on my finger and now let's pull it apart. Pulls apart super easily. Let's give this thing a taste. Mmm, that's tasty. I'm gonna give the bark a taste. Smoky, tender, offset smoker flavor. It's amazing. And also if you guys look right there, you can see how the fat is nice and rendered. It's got that yellow caramelly type consistency and it tastes absolutely amazing. Mm, that's next level. Oh my God, that's so good. Okay, now I'm gonna take a slice of the point and what I do is I just start on an edge and if there's any fat left, I will slice it off, but this one's pretty good. So I'll just cut these burnt ends off right here. One slice right there. These are our burnt ends. So I'll just chunk them up. And these are absolutely delicious. These are what you give to the people you like the most in your family or your favorite friends, because these are absolutely delicious. They've got that nice smoky bark on the outside. They've got perfectly rendered intramuscular fat on the inside. It's amazing. Okay, now let's take a slice of the point here. Now, if your point is overcooked, you can take larger slices. And if your point is undercooked, you can take smaller slices. That's a pro tip. Take a look at that. That is a thing of beauty. Wow. Ooh, that looks good. Now pull it apart, do the pull test. Pulls apart effortlessly. Let's see how it tastes. Mmm, heavenly. That is my favorite bite of brisket. That point muscle, oh. This brisket is perfect. Woo! All right, guys, moving on to the second brisket. This is the brisket that I cooked in the reverse flow setup on the Longhorn. Let's see what it looks like. This has been resting for 16 hours now in my sous vide holding chest at 150. So I'm thinking it should be pretty well done. I'm just gonna test it a little bit here, maybe probe into it just in case it needs to go back in. It is probing really tender in the point. And in the flat, let's see, it's a little bit tough in the flat, but I think it's as done as it's going to get. So I'm going to take this out and I'm just gonna pull the trigger on this, see how it goes. All right, the big reveal, take a look at that. It's feeling really nice. It's actually feeling a little bit tough on the bottom as I poke my fingers into the bottom of it. 
especially in the flat, it seems a little bit tough, like it got a little bit too much radiant heat from that um, baffle plate on the bottom right below it. But we'll find out, slice into this thing, line that up for you guys. And I'm going to use a very long slicing knife for this. I'll cut right down the middle. And you know, one thing I wanted to add is that you guys have probably noticed this, the bark is a little bit less dark than the direct flow setup brisket. So that's something that doesn't necessarily affect the taste of the brisket, but it affects the appearance. And I like a really dark bark. So that's kind of a negative for this one. So let's give this a slice. It's slicing really nicely so far. Let's see if there's any crunchiness at the end of the brisket here. No, it's pretty tender all the way throughout. So that's a good sign. We'll take a look on the inside here. I'll give you guys a nice close up. Ooh, that's actually looking quite nice. It looks comparable to the last brisket that we just looked at. No issues with that. Just gonna spread some tallow on there so it doesn't oxidize. Fat is going to prevent the air from getting to the muscle tissue and oxidizing it. So it looks nice and pretty for your friends and family. Okay, let's take a slice of the flat here. Give you guys a close up. Ooh, that is looking actually really good. Let's pull it apart. Well, I'll do this thing where you rest it on your finger. That doesn't really mean much. It just tells you that you cut the slice really thin. <laughs> Sometimes even if it's, you know, not bending all the way over, it's still a pretty tender brisket. So now let's pull it apart. Pulls apart perfectly. Now let's give this a taste. Really good. Just gonna taste a little bit of the bark here. The flat is really good. It's pull apart tender. It's not overcooked, but it's getting to the point where I would consider it overcooked. You can tell it's a little bit drier than the flat on the last brisket. And again, I think that's because the flat, the underside of the brisket got a little bit of too much extra heat from the radiant energy coming off the baffle plate directly below the brisket. But otherwise it's a really good brisket. My family and friends wouldn't notice the difference. They'd think it's amazing. The other thing I noticed, it's a little bit less smoky than the direct flow offset. I don't know the reason for that. I thought that the reverse flow setup would produce more smoke. Maybe it's because I used more charcoal and less wood, but I don't think I did actually in the reverse flow setup, I actually used more wood. So kind of strange, tasty brisket though. Okay, let's see, while I was talking, this thing was oxidizing. That's a big no-no. That's why you do this. Just give it a brush of this tallow and it'll be good to go. All right, now let's slice into the point here. I'm just gonna take off some burnt ends. Some big old burnt ends. Slather this, slather that, get some chunks. These are really tasty, but I'm not gonna try them right now. And let's get some slices of the point here. Point's looking really nice. Imagine doing this right in front of your family and friends. That's what I love. They're just like, oh man. It's like everyone's gathered around the Thanksgiving table and someone's carving a turkey. This is a thousand times better than that. If you guys can pull it off where your brisket is perfectly done and you can just roll it out on the dinner table and slice it right in front of everyone, that's money, money. And this is an extra step you guys don't have to do, but if you're going through all the trouble of cooking a brisket, you might as well do this because it adds a lot of extra flavor uh, to the brisket and juiciness. And it's what pretty much all barbecue restaurants do. They get some board tallow on their gloves and then before they put the brisket slice on your tray, they'll kind of slather it. And that's why it tastes so good. So let's look at this one. Ooh, that's actually, that's probably one of the best slices of uh, point muscle I've seen in the past uh, few videos that I've done. That looks really good. Really nice smoke ring. The fat cap is decently rendered. I usually like it to be a little bit more yellowish on top and, and less white and opaque at the bottom. And you typically get that a little bit better when you're doing the direct flow setup because you're getting more top down heat. Let's take a taste. Hmm, that's good guys. That's the best bite of the brisket guys, the point muscle. And what I like to do when I eat brisket is I have a little dram of scotch. My brother-in-law foolishly left this at my house. Um, there's a little bit left here. Maybe I'll just fill the rest of it up with water so he doesn't notice. <laughs> it's called the Glendronach Revival, 15 years. That sounds good to me. That smells tasty. I'm just gonna take a little, little snifter. Nothing better than a little bit of good quality single malt Scottish whiskey with a perfectly cooked brisket. Oh, that's really good. Caramel type flavor, black cherry. That makes sense. Guys, this is good. Mm. Woo, scotch. Okay, so conclusions on the direct flow setup 
for brisket versus the reverse flow setup for brisket. In general, I preferred the direct flow method and the brisket that it produced. It seemed to have a little bit better fat cap rendering on top of the fat cap, and it uh, produced a better flavor on the fat cap as a result. It uh, had a bit more smoky flavor with the direct flow setup and it created a darker bark. With the reverse flow setup, it seemed to get a little bit too much radiant heat from the baffle plate below it, even though I had that water pan next to the firebox to kind of suck up some of that extra energy and radiant heat and preventing the baffle plate from getting too hot. It seemed to be getting a little bit extra heat on the bottom and as a result, the flat got a little bit dried out and the point uh, was a little bit undercooked to my preference, but still really good. And I think that the long hold, whether you're holding it in your oven or a sous vide bag, or you make a sous vide holding chest like I made, you don't have to go to that extent, or you're just using a toaster oven or a turkey roaster, and you can get a consistent 150 degrees Fahrenheit and hold that brisket for 16 to 20 hours after you bring it up to 190-ish, then it's gonna be amazing. And that is my favorite method of cooking brisket. I think it produces perfect results every single time. And all of the stuff that happened during the cook is kind of smoothed out during that long hold method. So even though the flat was a little bit overcooked and even though it didn't get as much smoke flavor and maybe got burnt in some areas, it was evened out during that long hold period. So both briskets were absolutely amazing. I think the big advantage of a reverse flow smoker, including the Oklahoma Joe's Longhorn in the reverse flow setup, is that you can cook a lot of extra meat on it without burning it. With the direct flow setup, often if you use the third of the grilling or smoking area that's right next to the firebox, you'll tend to get overcooked burnt meat in that area because you're getting a lot of radiant heat from the fire that's that's burning it up. So if you're cooking a bunch of pork butts, the one that's closest to the firebox will get pretty burnt up. But with the reverse flow setup, you, you kind of get more even heat throughout the entire cooking surface. So you can fill it up with all sorts of different meats and you can cook them a little bit more evenly. I think that's the situation when I would use the reverse flow setup. So it's handy to have that versatility with the Longhorn reverse flow because if I'm just doing a bunch of chicken wings and I want them to cook really evenly across the entire cooking surface and I wanna smoke them, I would use the reverse flow setup. But if I'm doing a brisket, I would definitely use the direct flow setup because it just gets better bark, it gets better flavor, it gets better smoke, it gets better top down fat cap rendering, more even heat. And that is just my preferred method to cook brisket. But I'm interested to hear what you guys think. Do you like the reverse flow setup or the direct flow setup better for some meats versus others or for all meats? Let me know in the comments section below and I'll get back to you if you have any questions. Also, if you like my content, check out my channel, Smoke Trails Barbecue. There's all sorts of videos on me smoking brisket and how I smoke brisket on different types of cookers. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next video and happy smoking.